If you would please to Exodus chapter 3, please. Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 3 for our scripture reading. We are going to read verses 1 through 15. Verses 1 through 15 of Exodus chapter 3. We read the verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 1. <clears throat> I'll read verse 2 and we'll alternate reading verse 3 together and we'll alternate verses like that until we end together on verse 15 of Exodus chapter 3. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word and let's begin together on verse 1 of Exodus chapter 3. Ready? Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land, unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. And let's pray together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we bow before you now this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring men of old. 
that they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And thank you, Lord, that you preserved your word, and we hold copies of it in our hand this morning. And Lord, I pray that you'd make our hearts ready to receive your word today. Thank you already for the good music today and the good fellowship, the good spirit that's in this place. And Lord, I pray that you would bless the special as it's sung and that it would put our heart in tune with your heart. And we would all have ears to hear what the spirit would want to say to his church this morning. So use the special to that end is my prayer. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seem long. In darkness he giveth a song. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the Master that day, then peace came and tears fled away. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knows at the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Now I can see testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in his care. Through purging, more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knows at the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Amen. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer this morning as we come to the preaching of your word. Father, we're asking you to speak to hearts as only you can. Lord, I would ask you that you would help each of us to give our attention to your word this morning. Lord, each of us would focus and not be distracted in our mind from hearing what you would want to say to your church this morning. So, Father, I pray you would help me as I bring the message today, and please help the people as they listen, that what you would like to do in each one of our hearts, you will be able to do. And I pray that your word would accomplish what you desire it to accomplish in each one of our hearts and lives today. And I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. The book of Exodus chapter 3, if your Bible's open there this morning, <clears throat> Most of you are familiar with this story if you've been in church for any length of time or if you grew up in Sunday school. It's Moses' encounter with the burning bush. Uh, and it's not just a burning bush, it's a talking burning bush. And uh, you get the voice of God from the burning bush. And Moses uh, responds to God calling him after 40 years being on the backside 
of the desert. Uh, God is going to change Moses. God is going to transform Moses. And that's exactly what God desires to do for each one of us. God desires that we experience a transformation. That transformation takes place when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. Uh, he changes us from the inside out. Then he's going to uh, tell Moses, I've got a job for you to do. And it's not a job you do on your own. It's a job I'm going to partner with you with. I'm going to be with you. And we're going to redeem the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And I want us to look at this today and glean some lessons for us that I think are going to be helpful uh, to you and to me this morning. Uh, the first thing I want you to see is what Moses said in verse 11. Moses said unto God, what's the next three words, church? Who am I? You ever ask yourself that question? Who am I? That's a, you say, well, of course I know who I am, and you might say your name. But is that who you are? Who are you? Moses, I think, was probably going through a bit of an identity crisis himself as to who he really was. You remember his birth. At the time Moses was born, they were killing all the male children born in Egypt. But he did not want his, his parents uh, knew him to be a goodly child. And you know the story, they made an ark and they put him in it and put him down in the bulrushes in the river. And, and, and of course Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe and she heard him crying and she ends up sparing the, the Hebrew's life and takes him home to rear him as her own. And so he knows that in a miraculous way I was spared. And Jochebed, his mother, and Amram, his father, I'm sure they taught him some things. And as she nursed him and took care of him, uh, he was taught uh, in the things of God. He was also in Pharaoh's house, so he was taught the things of the Egyptians and the false gods of the Egyptians. Was he destined to live out his life as a Hebrew and, 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 and serving the God of the Hebrews? Or was he, was he an Egyptian? And was he destined to live out the life of an Egyptian? Was he to be in that line of Pharaohs, possibly becoming a ruler in the land of Egypt? Was he a murderer? He killed a guy. They were arguing one day and he rose up and he killed him. And just to make sure nobody found out, he dug a hole and buried him in the sand. So who am I? Am I a slave? Am I a Hebrew slave? Am I an Egyptian? Am I a ruler? Am I destined to be that? Am I a murderer? How about, how about am, I, am I just a under-shepherd working for my father-in-law? He had gone out to Midian on the backside of the desert and, and he happened to have some uh, women one day having a rough time uh, at the well getting water and, and Moses rescued him. And they came back rather quickly with their water and the father was impressed how quickly they came back and, and they said how a fellow helped them and it ended up being Moses. Well, he ends up marrying one of them girls and now Jethro, not the same guy from the Clampets, but Jethro is his father-in-law. And he gets a job working for his father-in-law. Now, he's a shepherd there for 40 years. And, and, and he wonders, who am I? Am I a shepherd? Is that, is, that, is that me? Am I a Hebrew? Is that me? Am I an Egyptian? Is that me? Am I a murderer? Is that me? Who am I? I don't think he's just necessarily thinking he's unworthy, though he did think that. I think he's generally questioning just really who am I anyway. You ever think about that yourself? When you do things in your life and, and it's not consistent maybe with what you believe, not consistent with, with uh, who you say you are, I, I don't have any problem wondering Moses thinking, who am I? As I said earlier, I think for sure he felt he was unworthy to be called by God or God to even speak to him. I think that's why he was amazed to hear God's voice coming out of the bush. You know, when he says, I'm kind of... I don't feel worthy. You remember, Moses wasn't the oldest son. Moses had an older brother. 
Who was he? Aaron. Aaron was his older brother. Who's going to get the inheritance? Aaron will. He's firstborn. I'm, I'm second son. I'm kind of chopped liver. Now, I was spared, and God has a plan for me. I'm sure he understood that. But he, he realized the generational blessing is going to go to Aaron. Aaron stayed with the people. Aaron was still with the people in Egypt. He'd been raised a Jew and, and stayed with the, the, his Jewish roots. He hadn't ran away like Moses did. I ran away when things got tough. I ran away when the heat was on. I'm not worthy. I don't think Moses thought he was smart enough. I mean, who would, <clears throat> who would think I'm very smart to kill a guy? To let my temper get the best of me? And uh, to take somebody's life? Who do you think? How smart do you think I am when, when I'm run away when I was living in Pharaoh's palace? I had the best of the best. I had the best things to eat, the best clothes to wear, the best education you could have. I had everything anybody would want. I guess I'm not too smart to throw all that away. I don't think Moses really thought he was good enough. I don't think he was worthy. I think he really have an idea, who am I anyway? You ever felt that way? You ever felt just who am I anyway? You ever felt not worthy enough? Ever felt not good enough? Ever felt you weren't smart enough? For God to do anything with? Everything that uh, here's Moses uh, thinking, 40 years I've been a shepherd. And hey, 40 years and I'm still working for my father in law. Can you think of somebody else who worked for their father in law? Somebody named Jacob? And you know what? In 20 years' time, half that time, Jacob had accumulated enough wealth and accumulated enough cattle. He was ready to kiss father-in-law goodbye. And he did. Most said, I've been here twice as long as Jacob. And I got nothing. I just got the same flock I had 40 years ago. I stink at being a shepherd. No pun intended. I mean, he just felt like he was a failure all the way around. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like everything I do doesn't work? Yeah, yeah, you want to mess something up, just involve me in it. I'll mess it up. Hmm? I've, I've, I've heard people say that. Hmm? That's how they feel. Who am I? I'm, I'm surely not good enough. I don't think Moses particularly liked being around people at all. Look where he made his home. Backside of the desert. Pretty sparsely populated place where he wouldn't have to see anybody. Wouldn't have to be around any people. The backside of Mount Horeb. I think he was there because he wanted to be away from everybody and everything. You ever felt that way? Hmm? Lastly, I think he says, who am I? Because you know what? Moses is 80 years of age. And you know what? At 80, he wasn't really looking for a big life change. He was pretty well, this is how I live out my days. I think I've had enough changes as it is already. Life has beat me up pretty good, I'm sure he thought. And all he really wanted to do was be left alone. And so he didn't care to be around anybody else. But God had different plans. I, I think he says, who am I? Because I think in Moses' mind, he realized I'm a nobody. I'm less than a nobody, I'm a nothing. I believe that's really how he felt. I think he was willing to live out the rest of his days just there on the backside of the desert being an under-shepherd and working for his father-in-law. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like Moses and you feel like, well, I'm just going to live out the rest of my life and nothing will happen, nothing will happen. It's okay. I've had enough things happen in my life. I don't need anything else to happen. I'll just live out the rest of my days and I'll die. And I'm okay with that. You just resign yourself to that. You sure aren't ready for God to come and say, hey, I've got something for you to do. And if God came and told you that today, there's some in this room who'd look at God and say, me? Who am I? Who am I? And God, you'd probably remind God how old you are. 
There are not many in this room past 80. I told Brother Jarvis on the phone, he called me about their transition to Roatan there in Honduras. His prayer letter came out and he gave me a phone call and talked about how they're going to, they have a place there and they're going to live there permanently. And I said, well, man, God's changed you. God's changed your path of ministry, but you're only 70. God did it to Moses at 80. You got 10 more years, you're all right. And, uh, of course, he laughed. But, you know, I think Moses thought nothing good's ever going to happen in my life anymore. But that's who am I? Who am I? But then I want you to notice what God said. Moses says, well, I'm going to go. If I go... And I go to the children of Israel and tell them the God of my fathers has sent me. And they ask me, what's his name? What am I supposed to say to them? In verse 14, God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. <clears throat> I got news for you. As much as Moses was confused and concerned about who he was, God had no doubt about how, who he is. Amen? God knows who he is. And God is confident that he is the great I am. And that's what he tells Moses. I'll reveal myself, God says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I'm the God who sees my people's affliction. I'm the God who can rescue and redeem my people out of the land of Egypt. I'm the God who promised them the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land that flows with milk and honey. I'm the God who created everything in six literal days. I put the sun, the moon, and the stars in their places. Uh, I'm the one who gives you the seasons. There'll be springtime and harvest, there'll be cold and heat, uh, there'll be summer and winter, uh, all that's put in motion. My friend, it isn't Mother Nature, it is the I Am God that puts it all together. And the I Am God that holds it all together. All things are held together by Him. He's the great I Am. While Moses might have been full of confusion, God was crystal clear and clear as a bell. Can you tell? Listen, when you or I are confused, I want to help you this morning. God is never confused. God is never at a loss. God is never perplexed. Okay? God always knows what he's doing. When Jesus came on the scene, Jesus looked at people and he said, Hey, hey, hey. They said, We, we only believe in our father Abraham. He says, I'm going to tell you something. Before Abraham was, I am. Oh, they knew what he was talking about. They're saying, he's saying, you're saying you're God. You're saying you're the I am that appeared to Moses. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the I am. God in the flesh. You're here today and you may be a little confused about who you are. That can happen to us. But we can, we can be assured of two things. God knows who He is. And number two, God knows what He's doing. He always knows what He's doing. He's going to give Moses some help here. And He'll give you and me some help. Notice what He said in verse 12. He said, says to Moses, Certainly I will be with thee. Moses said, who am I? God says, I am. And then God says, I will be with you. I'll be with you. What exactly does that mean? Well, think about where Moses is. He's, he's all by himself. He's on the backside of the desert. In fact, you know, he's got nobody to talk to. 
And that's why when, when the bush catches fire and it doesn't consume, he figures, I better turn aside and look at this. And then when the bush starts talking to him, he's, he's really enthralled. Because he had probably hadn't anybody talked to him for a while. And he wants to talk. And he wants to listen. Mount Horeb, the very word means wasteland, desolate, dry. And that pretty much describes Moses' life at the time. Pretty desolate, pretty dry, a wasteland. I think he was a very low point in his life. I was talking about this with somebody this last week. You know, most people come to know Christ at a low point in their life. God, God puts you in a wasteland to where you have nowhere to look and no one to turn to but to look up. Say, I need help. When the prodigal went away and wasted it all in, 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 in riotous living, he got to where he ran out of everything and nobody would give him anything and he ended up in the pig farm looking at the pig slop and the food for the pigs looked pretty good. And it was in that wasteland and in that smell and in that filth and in that loneliness that he said, I came to myself. My people back home got it better than I did. I need to go and say I've sinned against you. God will put you there. He put some of you there. You're shaking your head. You've been there. You know what God can do. But He does that so we'll look to Him. Notice, notice the way God addressed Moses. He calls His name out twice. He says, Moses, Moses in verse number 4. It's interesting, there's, there's about eight times in the Bible God called somebody's name twice. And it was in the ancient days, in those days, it was a way of, it was a way of showing someone you really cared about them. It was, a, it was really an endearing term, and a term that let them know that you really loved them. You see, it let Moses know God isn't there to beat him up. God isn't there to... Uh, uh, beat him into the ground further than what he already feels like. He's let him know, Moses, I care about you. Moses, I love you dearly. Moses, I've come to help you and I want to forgive you. I want to transform you. He says, I'd like to make you into a new person. And, and he said, I'd like to transform you into somebody else. You say, oh, can that happen when you're 80 years of age? It sure did for Moses. God, doesn't, God is not concerned about your age, my friend. God can change your life. He can change your heart. He can save your soul no matter what age you are. As long as we can feel your wrist and there's still a pulse there, my friend, you're a candidate to receive salvation. Because there's always hope to receive Christ as your Savior. I think it's also significant that he called out to him from this thorny bush. I think it illustrated the pain and suffering that Moses might have been feeling on his inside. You ever, you ever done something that you wish you could go back and undo? The pain is just there. But you can't undo it. He can't go back and undo what he did in Egypt. He can't go back and bring that guy back to life. <laughs> he cannot do that. And there's pain and there's thorns hurting him inside. And then out of this thorny bush, God speaks to him. And I think he's saying, Moses, I understand your pain and your suffering. I understand the pain you have on the inside of not controlling your anger. Having done something you regret killing that guy. I know that I know the pain you have of, of, of dealing with a lost dream now for 40 years. Of what you thought you would do with your life and what you thought your life would be like and what it has been like for 40 years. 
Sure is different. Difficult to live with. And I think he was resolved that the rest of his life he just lived with that pain and that suffering. Could I tell you something? When Jesus Christ came to earth and they finally betrayed him, put the false witnesses against him, convicted him, the soldiers to make fun of him, put a crown of thorns upon his head. To feel the pain, you have no idea. They, uh, there's differing thoughts on this, the, the thorns and such, but I've, I've read mo- where it's not unusual, they could be six inches long. And they shoved those things down on his head. And the blood came down. Why? He was taking our pain for us. The Bible says God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did it on our behalf. Hey, He took my place. I thought of that song as I was making this message. Uh, Where's Bob? Bob's back there. Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray, not my will, but thine, Lord? Who am I? It doesn't matter who you are. Christ died for you. He died for your sin. He took your place on the cross. So you wouldn't have to. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to be separated from God in a place called hell where everybody would deserve to go. What do you have to do to die and go to hell? Absolutely nothing. Just live. He that, uh, listen, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to Condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Because listen, if those who don't believe, the Bible says, are condemned already. We're all under that condemnation. The only way to lift that condemnation off us is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's only through Jesus Christ. I like the fact that God told Moses to remove his shoes because the place he's standing was holy ground. What's that? God, you ever think about that? God wanted to be so in touch with Moses. He didn't even want the leather of the sandals to be between him and feeling God. He wanted it to be skin to skin, so to speak. That's the closeness. They sang today, the choir, nothing between my soul and the Savior. Let nothing come between being close to Him and having His touch in my life. What do you think that felt like to Moses who was was running away from everybody and didn't want to be around anyone and didn't want to be close to anybody Struggling with his own identity and his own worth. Who felt no hope in his life. A man who felt like he'd lost everything. Who felt like, I I try my best and it's never good enough. It never makes the grade. All I got is a little flock of sheep working for my father-in-law. One thing I found out as I was preparing this that I never realized in, in in. they're, they're ancient rabbis. They believe that this burning bush encounter that we just read and think it just took maybe a few minutes, they actually think that it, it took at least a week that Moses and God went back and forth with each other. Now that's interesting because at least two other occasions, Moses went up on the mountain and spent 40 days and 40 nights with God. So that, that just may have some credence to that. 
But as Moses would pour out his heart to God and God would re respond to Moses, it shows how, how deep that relationship began to be and how, how important that was that they would talk one with another. These things that God respond to Moses and Moses would say to God, I don't think it's things that you would process and digest in just a few minutes' time. It would take some time to think about and process in your life. I mean, he's, he's adjusting some things. He, he's undoing some 80 years of wrong thinking. In some cases, he's undoing 40 years of wrong thinking. And I'm telling you, we, we, it, it, it is one of the hardest things you do is change the way you think. Because you change the way you live by changing the way you think. If you don't change your thinking, you'll never change your living. And God transforms the way we think. And that's what He's doing with Moses. He commissions him. He said, I'm going to send you back to free my people Israel out of the bondage of Egypt, out of the slavery that's in Egypt. He says, but I'm not sending you by yourself. I'm going to send you, I'm going with you. Could God have done it without him? Could God have gotten him out of, out of Egypt without Moses at all? Absolutely. God could just overwhelm him with a stroke of his hand if he wants to. He could, in fact, he could speak the word and it would happen. He spoke the worlds into existence. The power of his word. God could have done it without him. But he enlists Moses to help, to help him to be the helper in redeeming the people of Israel. But God has commissioned us. God says, I sent my son into the world to die, as we said earlier, for the whole world. God so loved the world. I don't believe for a second God died for a few. I believe God died, Christ died for all. I believe it's whosoever will may come. How will the world know? How will that message get out? Will it be angels? Angels announced the birth of Jesus. They announced to Mary she'd have Jesus. They announced to the shepherds that Jesus was born. At the resurrection, when He rose from the dead, angels were there to say, He's not here, He's risen. When He ascended back up to heaven at the ascension, it was angels in heaven that said, Why are you standing gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner if you see Him going to heaven. Will it be? Surely it's going to be angels. And God says, no. It's not going to be angels. It's going to be those of mankind that has received my Son as their Savior. I'm going to commission them to go into all the world and tell everyone about Jesus Christ. To go and preach the Gospel. What did Jesus say? All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He said, uh, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. That's what he told Moses, wasn't it? I'll be with you. Hey, we go out to tell others, Hey, I've heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And the great news is, I'm not there by myself. He's with me. And He's with you. He's with you. We've been commissioned to get out the Word. We've been commissioned to get out the Gospel. But you're not there alone. He's with you. I'm not opposed to the salespeople, but listen, you got... We got more with us. We got more going on than, than the Avon lady. We got more going on than the, than the salesman knocking on the door. We got more going on than, than, than anybody who's trying to sell you something. Why? We have God with us. We have Jesus with us. 
We are co-laborers together with Him. And we have a commission. Who have you told about the Lord this week? Who have you talked to about Jesus Christ? Listen carefully. Do you find yourself in need of God's forgiveness? God's transforming grace? You're here today and you, you may be hearing things like, you know, uh, being transformed or being changed or Jesus is the way and maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Simply trying to tell you that, listen, in order to go to heaven, there's only one way. You must come through Jesus Christ. It's not a Baptist way. It's not a Methodist way. It's not a <clears throat> Catholic way. It's not a Lutheran way. It's a Bible way. It's what the Bible says to go to heaven. You must come to the fact and realization I'm a sinner. And, and as a sinner, I deserve to pay for my sin. And the Lord said that penalty for sin will be death and hell. But that's why He sent His Son to die on the cross as a payment for sin. For my sin and for yours. And God says if you'll by faith trust Jesus Christ in His payment for your sin, He'll give you the gift of eternal life. And you shall be saved. Don't miss that opportunity. Don't pass that up. You may have other opportunities to accept Christ as your Savior, but you'll never have a better opportunity than you have right now to receive Him as your Savior. If you're here today and you know the Lord is your Savior, but maybe you've been like Moses. You made some bad decisions. Made some bad choices. And sometimes you wonder just who am I? Am I, am I that guy? Am I that girl? Am I, am I this? Am I this? Who, who am I? Let me remind you, God knows who He is. And God knows what He's doing. Come to Him. He wants to use you again. He wants to be close to you again. He, he's, he wants to commission us to be the, 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 the sowers of the seed of the gospel throughout the world. That's you and me. God wants to partner with us. It's an amazing thing. God wants to use you. you say, who? Who, me? Yeah. You. Huh? He used, he used Moses. He'll use you. God, uh, old uh, friend back here mentioned Bob Jones. I think he's talking about Bob Jones Jr. You know, Bob Jones Sr. used to say, God only has crooked sticks to use. Huh? It's true. We're all crooked sticks. Thank God who used crooked sticks. Why don't you ask God to let the fire of the Holy Spirit, the fire of that burning bush, light a fire in your soul today to see who you are in Christ. Who you are in Him. You're accepted in the Beloved. You're a joint heir of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's, that's unbelievable. God's given you all things as a child of God that pertain to life and godliness. I'm accepted in the Beloved. I'm a child of the King. So are you. Who are you in Christ? God is with us, in us, working in us and through us to bring other people out of bondage and into faith in Jesus Christ. Moses went back. God worked through him and the plagues came into Egypt and finally what got him out of Egypt, Egypt is a picture of the world, what got them out of Egypt was the death of the firstborn. The blood applied to the doorpost. They'd take a lamb without blemish and without spot. Are you listening? They'd take a lamb without blemish, without spot of the first year and, and they would have to kill that lamb and put that blood, apply that blood to the doorpost of their house. The death angel, when he came, if he saw the blood, he'd pass over your house and you wouldn't have anyone die. You wouldn't lose your firstborn. And that's when they said, get out of here. And they got out of Egypt. Listen to me. There's a judgment coming. 
God will again send that death angel. How do you, how do you not die? Well, you've got to take the blood of the Lamb. But God sent the Lamb. When Jesus Christ came to this world, John the Baptist stood on the shore and he said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God sent His Lamb. His only begotten Son who shed His blood on the cross of Calvary. And when you apply that blood to your heart, then when the death angel comes, He passes over you. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed you from all sin. Have you received Him as your Savior today? Have you ever received Christ? Do you know for sure that if you died this morning, you'd go to heaven? All you need to do is call on Him. Hey, it's as simple as receiving a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, it wasn't easy on His part. He did all the hard stuff so we could have it as a gift. If you've never received that gift, I would beg you to receive that gift today. If you're here today and you're, maybe you feel like you're on the backside of the desert with Moses, would you let God speak to your heart today? That He knows where you are. He didn't come condemning Moses. He didn't come judging Moses. He didn't come uh, ready to hit him over the head with a hammer. He came lovingly and said, Moses, Moses, I've got something for you to do. He was 80. God still used him. Who am I? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you for putting this in the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to glean some truths here from your conversation with Moses that day with the burning bush. And Father, I'm asking you this morning that you have spoken to people's hearts. Thank you for everyone's attention today. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is spoken to the hearts of people in this room. I'm asking you that decisions will be made in their heart and life that will affect them both in time and in eternity. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. But right now, just between you and God, I wonder how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I needed a Savior. And I knew Jesus Christ was the Savior I needed. And Pastor, there's a time in my life when I called on Jesus and from my heart I asked Him to be my Savior. And Pastor, today I know that I'm saved. I know I have eternal life. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment and say, Pastor, that's me. That's my testimony. I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. You hear today would say, Pastor, I, I don't know that for sure. I don't know for certain if I died, I'd go to heaven. Would you let me pray for you this morning? I won't call you out, not going to embarrass you, but I will pray for you. You couldn't raise your hand the first time, but you'd raise it this time and say, Pastor, pray for me today. I'm not certain about that. Would you slip it up and put it back down that I may see it? Is there someone like that? Well, you couldn't put your hand up the first time. You'll put it up this time. Just say, pray for me, Pastor. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. If you slipped your hand up, and you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven. In a moment, when I'm done praying, we'll have our invitation. Christians, will be coming to the altar to pray. When they slip out of their seat and they come forward, why don't you come with them? And come down here to the front. We'll have someone take a Bible. They'll take you aside privately. Let them show you from the Bible how you can know you have eternal life. Don't don't walk out the doors today unsure. Don't walk out the day without receiving that gift. What an opportunity you have. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. How many Christians here today would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart. I I feel like I may be in a Moses position. There's times I just don't know who I am. 
But if God will take me back and God will use me, I sure would like God to use me again. I want God to change me, transform me, partner with me, and use me. Pastor, God spoke to my heart today. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. That's good. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray now, and we'll have our invitation. As you come, Christian, to pray, those of you who do not know Christ, you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven, just slip from your seat and come. Come with the others. I'll meet you right here at the front. It'll be the best decision you ever make in your life. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts today. Thank you, Lord, for hands that have been lifted, indicating that you're dealing with their heart. And Lord, I'm asking you that your will and way would be done in every individual life here this morning. And those whom you've spoken to, that they would respond to you today. Those who need to come and be shown how they can know Christ and have eternal life. May they come. May Christians come. And may they kneel down. And as they kneel down and pray, may they have that burning bush experience that Moses had. May you draw them close to yourself this morning. Have your way now in this invitation. I'll thank you for it. With our heads bowed, you stand to your feet as you stand to your feet. Our pianist is going to play. As our pianist plays, I want you to respond to him this morning. Will you please? That's right. That's right. When I think of how he came That's right. so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly such as I, to suffer shame and such disgrace, on Mount Calvary take my place. It's then I ask myself this question, who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray, not my will thine for? The answer I may never know, why he ever loved me so, that to an old rugged cross he'd go, for who am I? When I'm reminded of his words, I'll leave thee never. Trust in me, I'll give you you a life forever. I wondered what I could have done to deserve God's only Son. To fight my battles till they're won, for who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray, not my will thine for? The answer I may never know Why he ever loved me so To that old rugged cross he'd go For who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray not my will thine for? The answer I may never know why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he'd go for who am I?
go ahead and be seated for a minute if you would, all right? Appreciate your patience this morning as folks being dealt with. I have one man being dealt with this morning for salvation, so pray for him. Got a couple names to read for you this morning. We're glad to have Zoe Van Cleef. Zoe is 16 years of age, and uh, Zoe, this is an amazing story. Her uh, aunt, uh, Tara's sister, is a missionary wife with Rock of Ages Prison Ministry, and uh, she sent Zoe a New Testament to read. Zoe was reading the New Testament, and she sent her mama a text last Monday and said, I want to be saved and baptized. And they have talked to her through the week, and then yesterday they came to church here, and we sat in a conference room and uh, went through the plan of salvation, and Zoe prayed and asked the Lord to be your Savior. And uh, wants to obey him in baptism today. Congratulations, Zoe. That's great. Praise God. And uh, God will save teenagers. Amen. That's good. God saves older guys too, doesn't he, Omari, huh? And uh, Omari is here, Omari Ball. Last Sunday, Omari came forward, wasn't sure of his salvation and received Christ as his Savior, and he wants to follow the Lord in baptism this morning. That's great, brother. God bless you, and uh, appreciate that very much. All right? You can go ahead, and Kathy, you go take her down, and Brother Don, you, Omari, you follow Brother Don down there, and they'll get you set up and get you ready to go, and I'll be down momentarily. We're also glad to have Emily Reed coming this morning. Emily's coming today rededicating her life to jesus christ isn't that great amen, amen. and uh you, you better clap for that that's amen. all right that's a good deal amen that's exciting and uh it's a a difficult thing that that's happened in the last week or two but it's uh i see the hand of god in it too emily freeing you to do what god wants you to do it's kind of exciting to see that and we're, we're excited for you god bless you pray for emily and amira uh the the shooting that happened in steubenville about what 10 days ago or so um that was amira's daddy uh who was killed and so um just pray for pray for the funeral services wednesday and uh just just pray for grace for for them as they go through that all right and uh, all right, we're getting ready to baptize uh, Omari and Zoe, and uh, Brother Bob will take you through a couple songs while we get ready. All right, well, let's, let's learn a new song this morning, all right? I think it's a new song for you, probably. 188, 188. This is happiness is the Lord. What we do is we sing that first verse, and then before we get to the chorus, we go right back to that second verse. And then we sing the chorus through, all right? Let's try this together. Ready? Happiness is to know the Savior living up within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me in close relation, having a part in his salvation. Happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter where the teardrops start. I found a secret, it's Jesus in my heart. Happiness is to be forgiven, living a life that's worth a living, taking a trip that leads to heaven. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is the Lord. Amen. How many, that's the first time you've sung that? I thought so. That's good, though. That's great. You like that? I like that. That's good. All right. Let's, uh make a mess i have another i've got a list here let's do um let's do 213 213 i'm learning to lean learning to lean learning to lean on jesus how many this is a new one for you all right good we like doing new ones very good so basically we sing the chorus first and then we sing the verse then the chorus and then the second verse all right 
we make sure and do some new ones for at least uh, for uh, Nancy too. All right. I'm learning to lean, learning to lean, learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I'd ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. The joy I can't explain fills my heart since the day I met Jesus, my King. His blessed Holy Spirit is leading my way. He's teaching and I'm learning to lean, learning to lean, learning to lean, I'm learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I'd ever dreamed, I'm learning to lean on Jesus. This glorious victory is day now for me, since found his peace so serene. He helps me with each test, if only I'll ask. Every day now I'm learning to lean, learning to lean, learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I'd ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Amen. That's good. It's a process, isn't it? Learning to lean on Jesus. Let's go back to 212. Uh, just one page, I guess. 212. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Let's sing that first together. When I saw the cleansing fountain open wide for all my sin, I obeyed the Spirit's willing when He said, Wilt thou be clean? I will praise Him, I will praise Him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. On that last, glory, glory to the Father, glory, glory to the Son, glory, glory to the Spirit, glory to the three in one. I will praise him. I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. Let's sing that chorus one more time without the uh, piano, all right? I will praise him, I will praise him, praise Zoe Van Cleef. And Zoe, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death, and 
Hey, you still watch this? Okay. <laughs> Found out in addition to Omari accepting Christ last week, his son Amani accepted Christ as well. Amen. And he is uh, he came over from Children's Church and he's gonna follow the Lord in baptism. Amen. 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 Some fish are bigger than others. <laughs> this is Amari Ball. And Amari, upon the public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death, raised in the likeness of Jesus' death. Profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to His command. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death and raised in the likeness of His <laughs> And the servant said, Master, it has done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Sing that again, huh? I will praise him. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away. Each stain. Amen. We can praise him in the good times. We can praise him in the hard times. And um, many, many years ago, uh, Luther Bridgers was a uh, uh, just a great godly man. He had a, a wonderful family. And he was uh, visiting his in-laws, if I remember the story correctly. And uh, while he was there, um, his family was there, and their house caught fire. And um, he was the only one that made it out alive. And out of that, uh, at that what we would consider a tragedy, he uh, penned the words to this uh, 250. And uh, it's pretty amazing. Because he, even through that great tragedy, can say, I will praise him. He says, there's within my heart a melody. Jesus, whisper sweet and low, fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. He says, all my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across those broken strings, stirred the slumbering cords. Again, feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Think about this is a guy who just lost his whole family. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path that seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. And we know that soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond that starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Let's sing a couple stanzas of this. He keeps me singing, all right? There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fair God, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I 
I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. This could fill my heart with pain. Jesus wept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering boards again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fill my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Well, praise the Lord. Good morning, wasn't it? I'm glad I came today. Hope you're glad you came, and uh, I'm still... God's still in the soul-saving business. It's great to see. Great to see. All right. Um, Bill, get rid of those chairs there, okay, because we're going to have people stand there when uh, they come out. Hopefully, they'll come up and go back there. And uh, so they feel you can greet the folks as you leave and uh, congratulate them on their receiving Christ and being baptized and uh, encourage them in their Christian life. Stay right back there, guys. He's going to have you park right there. Folks can see you when they go by, all right? All right, let's stand together, and we'll have a word of prayer. Hey, be back tonight, 5.30 Christian Growth Class. That's open to anyone. Of course, we encourage you to come. Then 6.30 tonight for the evening service. Remember the missionary cards on the table. Uh, take, take what the Lord puts on your heart and uh, give sacrificially and uh, be a blessing to the servants of God that will come our way. All right? Let's, uh, don't forget to see Bob if you want to get a T-shirt. We'll do that. And um, hey, Brother Wallace. Yeah. Okay, amen. Rededicating his life to Christ. Okay, amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for the decisions that have been made here today and throughout the week for you. Thank you for meeting with us. And Lord, I'm praying for these new believers that you'll strengthen them in the faith, that will be an encouragement to them and a blessing. Lord, I pray that they'll be faithful to the house of God and that we'll encourage them to be faithful. And Lord, that let them remind them that you'll never leave them nor forsake them. And Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you for decisions that were made for Christ. Thank you for these who have come back to you and said, Lord, use me. Uh, may your blessing be upon them today as well. Lord, dismiss us now with your care. Give us a good afternoon. And Lord, bring us back safely for the service this evening. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heads with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.